so glad that you're with us. And who took an ark to get to church today? Oh, boy. Well, you're welcome to take out your message outlines as we're continuing this series, uh, this thanks and giving attitude. Uh, thanks for coming out. We're so glad that you're with us and want to welcome those who are watching at home as well. Uh, today, I want to talk with you about, I, I think, a very important area um, personally and spiritually, and that is the area of goodness. Um, and it's important to realize that God has enabled and has given the, the strength to you and I to overcome obstacles with good. See, typically we think if we have an obstacle, we, you know, we got to overcome it maybe uh, with, with maybe somebody goes low, we got to go low. Uh, a situation is difficult and harsh, we got to become mean. That's what life's treating us like. Uh, no, God has something higher for us. Look what it says in Paul's letter to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Uh, this is a great verse to give it to memory. Why don't we say it right from the start together? Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, you're going to have situations in your life, even when people might be treating you evil or a situation might be difficult. You know, how are we going to respond? How are we going to overcome our obstacles? I heard this story about this gentleman who was a concierge um, at the concierge desk at a particular airport. And his job was to take the bags from people and then hand them off to the baggage claim area. It was a service that this airline provided. Most airlines do. And this one particular man, he was very rude and disrespectful because there wasn't a cart to take his bags. And so he told the man at the concierge desk, listen, I got to get to Miami. You know, we, we, got, we got a, a massage appointment we got to make, we got all these things we got to do. And he's going on and he's just berating this concierge at the, at the area. He's saying, listen, the cart is coming, don't worry. And then that continued on and finally got the guy's bags got taken away. Now, the man after him, it was his turn to come up, and he said, you know, I really, you know, I got to commend you. You kept your cool while this guy was just down your throat and being rude, and he just kept getting more disrespectful. I got to ask you, how do you handle situations like that? How do you remain so good? So he goes, well, that's easy. You know, listen, in this industry, you're going to get one or two of those a week. He goes, with that guy, you know, he's uh, going to Miami, but his bags are going to New Orleans, okay? <laughs> That's how I handle it. Now, I want to tell you something. Whatever side of the counter you're on, uh, you don't want to send people's bags to New Orleans, OK? You don't want to overcome your obstacles that way. And if you're running late on time and your schedule's tight, you certainly don't want to treat people like garbage either. That's not how you overcome you know, the time crunch obstacle. See, a majority of the things we go through in this life um, our response could quickly help turn it around. And so it's like that in life, it's like that with education, it's like that with sports, business, you name it. How are we responding to adversity? How are we responding to obstacles? And I submit to you one of the best ways to do it, God wrote the book on it, and that is to have this attitude of goodness. In fact, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And so we want to have this goodness. But what is goodness? Well, goodness means you're a goody two-shoes, no. Goodness means weakness, no. Goodness means uh, you're going to finish last place because nice guys finish last, no. What is goodness, you might wonder? Well, here's a definition we provided right here in your notes, okay? Goodness is the intrinsic response of good decisions, okay, and good actions. So in other words, goodness is an inside job. It's about something that's already taking place in you so that when the adversity, the difficulties, and listen, the obstacles come, you respond in a way that's not going to prolong the issue, but quite frankly could be an answer to it. God's called us to be people of goodness. Now, when I think about that understanding, that topic, I can't even begin to list a character who's better than the one we're going to study today. Because he was in a personal situation, an obstacle, if you will, and his response is profound, it's powerful. And of course, we're talking about Joseph from the Christmas story. And so I want to invite you to turn with me, if you haven't done so already, to the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew preserves uh, the record of the birth of Christ as well. He gives us the lineage of Jesus um, through Joseph's bloodline. That's what the genealogy is in the first 17 verses of his gospel. As we come to verse 18, 
he's going to give us the snapshot of what the angel Gabriel told Mary not too long ago concerning this amazing birth that's going to take place. And so starting in verse 18, this is what Matthew, the former tax collector, writes. By the way, Matthew's Gospel, 28 chapters long. I've told you before, everything in Matthew's Gospel, the chapters, the verses, the names in the Hebrew, all divisible by seven. Uh, God leaving a number code in the book of Matthew. I think that's apropos because Matthew's a numbers guy. He's an accountant. He's a tax collector, uh, a former tax collector. And Matthew gives us, uh, he puts before us his picture. You go through all 28 chapters of his Gospel, um, the kingdom of God. And so here he's going to explain the rightful leader of the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ. And he starts with his birth. He takes it all the way back to there. So starting in verse 18, this is what we read. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. So here's the birth of Christ, he says. He puts it before us. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, notice, before they came together. So you see now, um, just to break in the action here, but you see Matthew is correlating with Luke's record, and together uh, they are correlating with the book of Isaiah says, that Mary was unequivocally, um, when she gave birth to Christ, she was a virgin. So that's what's being put before us here. Before they came together, she was found to be with child, and the record says, of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man. Now, underline that phrase, just man. Say that with me. Just man. Now, what does that mean, a just man? Well, it means someone who's righteous, someone who has integrity, someone who does the right thing even when it's inconvenient, someone who goes the extra mile, someone who takes the high road when everybody else is stuck in traffic on the low road. It speaks of someone of an inner goodness. It says this, Joseph being a just man, and notice this, unwilling to put her to shame. You have to understand something, and in our culture today, people can't wait to shame people. They can't wait to rub somebody's face or for them to fall, and here you go, is your mistake, here's your sin. Meanwhile, we got our own sins, okay, but our sins always look better on everybody else. Have you ever noticed that? And so, Look what this says here, unwilling to put her to shame. Now, circle that word unwilling. In the Greek manuscript, what that means is, is Joseph had no conflict within his self, within his heart, within his mind, to shame Mary. See, in their culture, she could have even been stoned for this, okay? And not only did, if, as it looks right now, did she commit adultery, but she's also pregnant with somebody else's child. Meanwhile, she's pledged to be married to Joseph. You would think everything in his male, my, male fiber would want to put her to shame. How dare she do this to me and embarrass me in front of my family and friends? She's ruined my life. This woman says she loves me, but yet she's taking up with somebody else. But it says this, unwilling to put her to shame. And you know, I've been uh, you know, doing this for over, you know, well over 20 years, and I can't overstate this point. When Joseph acted like this, you know who he is reflecting? God. Because God doesn't shame me, and he doesn't shame you. Everybody has a past, okay? And everybody's past has sin in it, okay? I don't want to burst anybody's halo bubble or anything like that, okay? All right? Everybody has a past. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't have you and I coming here to church and all our past is up on the screen. We'd be running out, okay? God don't want to shame anyone. He didn't come to rub our sins in our face. He came to rub them out with his son, Jesus Christ. Joseph reflects God. Joseph's going to be the earthly father of Jesus. Who better than this man on the face of the planet at this point in history than to raise God's son, than somebody who resembles God and how he treats people? Joseph is an embodiment of goodness. The next part says, he resolved to divorce her quietly. You know what that tells us? He doesn't know the whole story. You know the whole story. I know the whole story. Joseph doesn't have the rest of chapter 1 here in Matthew, or Luke chapter 1, or Luke chapter 2 for that matter. So, in other words, Joseph's hurt, but his plan is, I'll still marry her to save her the shame. 
So not only is he not going to insult her with his mouth, not only is he not going to lead a parade to besmirch her character, he's actually going to protect her. He's going to marry her, move away. That's what that means. We're going to divorce her quietly. Um, I'll marry her in public, move away, and then privately divorce her. She goes her way, I go my way, and I don't know how life's going to work out, but that's how I'm going to handle it. You know what that speaks of? A man who was unwilling to shame this lady Mary. And I think in order for him to get there, I think there has to be a goodness in his life. And when you have a goodness in you, you're able to let things go even though you're hurt. But you're reflecting God. So write this first principle down if you haven't done so already. If you're going to be a person of goodness, I guess it all starts here, right? Reflect God's goodness in my relationships. Can you say that with me? Reflect God's goodness in my relationships. See, this is where it is. Lots of people quote the Bible fast and, and holier than now and everything like that. But how do you treat people? Lots of people love to be very boisterous in how they, you know, with God and everything like that. But how do you treat people? That's the real business of the game of Christianity. That's where the rubber meets the road. How do you treat people? Are you reflecting God in how you treat people? Or are you just some, some talking head, okay? Obviously, we don't want to be that. We want to be people who reflect the goodness of Almighty God. Because God has been good to us. And we want to be good and, and reciprocate that. Also notice that Joseph must have forgiven Mary. You know, let me just tell you that probably 99% of the things that we go through with each other in our families, those are called fender benders. We could forgive those things. I don't make light of any abuse that's taken place or any, anything of that nature. We'll file it in that category. That might take a significant amount of time and counseling and prayer and healing. So I don't make light of anybody's trouble that they've experienced in those areas. But 99% of the family fighting, friend fighting, church, anything, they're fender benders. Uh, they can be settled out of court, so to speak. We're going to drag people through the courts, okay, and, and, and put them on the stand and be mad at people and all that. Life is too short for that nonsense. We want to have this understanding that we want to act as God did. We want to have a goodness towards people. We don't waste time. We want to reflect the goodness of God, that that's his heart for me and his heart for you, that we want to use whatever we have for God's goodness. You know, to illustrate that for you, I heard about this man who was in the grocery store, and as he approached the clerk, he was $12 short for his bill. And so he didn't have any money on him, and so things were tight, and so he started to take groceries and put them back in the aisle, you know, near the annoying gum and the candy and all that type of stuff that's overpriced. So he started putting cans over there. And then this man behind him handed him a $20 bill. And he goes, sir, I, I can't take that from you. That's a lot of money. Plus, I only owe 12. No. He goes, no, take it. He's like, no, I don't want it. He goes, I insist. He goes, listen, my mother's in the hospital. I just came from there. She has cancer. She probably doesn't have long. Every day I bring her flowers. She just yelled at me to stop bringing her flowers. I'm not dead yet. Stop bringing me flowers. Stop wasting your money. She says, go do something good with your money. And he says, this is my mother's flowers I'm helping you with. We want to be a, a people of goodness. And you never know how that kind of works out in God's big picture. Because everything we have, even the difficulty in our life, God could use for good whether it's somebody on a clerk line getting ready to pay for groceries or some other situation. We want to be good. We don't want to be greedy. You know, I heard about this man who won the lotto. Back, matter of fact, it was just last month, November the 21st, this story was published. He won the, the Maine State Lottery up in Maine. And after the, he won the jackpot, by the way. And after, you know, the, the disclosure agreements and the, and the taxes and out, he walked away with $404 million dollars okay million dollars but now he's suing his daughter's mother because she told his family that he won he didn't want anybody to know that he won so he's suing her now i don't know maybe there's scoundrels on that side of the family but i think if you win 404 million you could afford in your family tree to help a few people out i would imagine so you know what the problem is is that sometimes we pray for things god opened this door god opened that door and we forget that it's god who gave us that Every blessing we have, we're going to be people of goodness, we must remember every blessing we have comes from God. Look what it says in James chapter 1, verse 17. 
This is James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, and he writes this letter to Jewish believers who have been scattered because of persecution. That's what his, uh, his book is about, or two, rather. And here, this is what he says in verse 17 of chapter 1. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Not Amazon, from above, together. Coming down from the of light. That's where it's from. It's from God. Everything we have. See, when we think that way, my talent, my time, my treasures, all of a sudden then we can have responses of goodness. That God, everything you've given to me, my talents, my relationships, you know, even in family, I don't want to be a troublemaker. I was going to bring my, uh, my long soup spoon because some people like to stir <laughs> trouble. God's called you to be a peacemaker. That's what a person of goodness does. Maybe you need to make peace in the family. Maybe God's calling you to be a peacemaker. Sometimes you got to tell people, hey, knock it off. Life is short. This is what God, God wants you to do this. Be bold and tell people that. And, and God will give you the words to say, he hasn't called us to go helping people remember the offenses. He wants us to help mend the fences, okay? And so, oh, that rhymes. I'm going to remember that for the next service, by the way. I'm going to remember that. Somebody write that down. I'm going to remember that for the next one, okay? Wasn't planning that, okay? But, but listen, be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. That's how we reflect the goodness of God. He's called us to act this way. Now, let's continue on here because, again, Joseph doesn't know the whole story here. Look what the next verse says in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 1, our main text. It says, but as he considered these things. Can you say that with me? But as he considered these things. Now, maybe, oh, hold it right there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, now think about this for a second here. Maybe you've been there where you had an obstacle in your life and the obstacle was on your mind where you were considering, I don't know how it's going to work out. Joseph has chosen to do the right thing, but still the right thing doesn't mean the problem's going to go away. He has this issue now that the woman that he's pledged to marry is with child, okay? And she says that the Holy Spirit did it. So he must be thinking, put yourself in his sandals. Either she's crazy, or she's the biggest liar ever to walk the planet. And as a man, okay, I'll tell you what I'm thinking right now is Joseph's a carpenter, so maybe he's in his wood shop and he's banging a nail. He probably lost the nail by now as he's banging. He's probably seeing different people's face as he's hitting the nail. Is it David? I saw him looking at it the other day. Is it Misha? Who did it? I'm going to go break some legs. He might, listen, what guy wouldn't think that? So as he considered these things, he's probably, you know, maybe that's coming into his mind. I don't know, when you get to heaven, you could ask him. Maybe he's thinking, what am I going to tell my family? What are we going to tell our family? He's thinking, what, what about the extension I built on the house? What, what, about, what about all these things he must have been thinking in his head? As he considered these things, look at the next part says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. You know what that tells us? He had one of those nights, maybe you've had it where you want to go to sleep at 10, but your obstacles are keeping you up. And you're up, and now, now it's, it's, then you see all the hours of the night, right? Now it's 1 o'clock, and, and then it's 2, and then, oh, no. Do you, you know, when you hit 3, you're, like, at the point of no return. You're like, yeah, well, I might as well just stay up at this point. That's how I feel. When I hit, you hit 3 o'clock, it's like, it's a loss. Let me just stay up. It's over. Okay? Can't write it off as a loss. I'll make up the sleep some other time. I hope I don't crash when I drive. That's what you start thinking. At that point, it's a loss. So it's 3 o'clock. I guarantee you, heaven was like, you know what? This poor guy is going to have a heart attack. Let's just, come, let's just tell him now, okay? And so God lets him go to sleep, okay? And he falls asleep. This is what I think happened. When I get to heaven, you could come up and find me when we're all in heaven and go, go you were right about this, okay? But this is exactly what happened. I think heaven finally said, let this poor guy go to sleep. He falls asleep, and the angel appears to him. Now, this is the angel Gabriel, by the way, because he's on birth announcement duty. He's already come to Zechariah and told him about Elizabeth being with child, even though she's you know, collecting Social Security, other benefits in 80-plus years of age. He comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to be with child, explains it to her, and now he comes to Joseph. But Joseph is going to get this information after he's made decisions of goodness, while he's still making decisions of goodness. Notice verse 20 didn't start off with saying, and then Joseph thought, well, wait a minute, I need to tell her something. It doesn't say any of that. Joseph was remaining in this position of goodness, and now notice the next part says, 
This is what the angel says now. Joseph, son of David, reminds David of his lineage. Uh, Joseph of his, his, really his messianic lineage, by the way. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary. Now, underline that phrase there, do not fear. And we'll mention this again at the midnight service, but when you close out the Old Testament and you open up the New Testament, the gap of history is approximately 400 years. How many years? 400 years. So in other words, there's silence from heaven for 400 years, from the close of the Old Testament to the opening of the New Testament. And the very first thing that heaven says after 400 years of silence is not a word to condemn anybody, is not a word to put anybody down or ridicule. The first word that of heaven after 400 years is what? Do not be afraid. And you know, maybe you need to remember that when maybe you've had some silence between you and God or you're going through an obstacle and you're wondering if this or if that. You've got to remember something. God is for you. You are a child of the Most High God. You don't need to fear. You need to be still and know that He's God. And that's what Joseph's being told here. And I, you know, you ever have a dream like this, okay, where God, you know, God might tell you something in your dream. I mean, this is pretty cool here. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Joseph, she's not crazy, okay. She's not crazy. I know where you thought it, but she's not crazy. Now, here's a principle that you're going to want to write down, and don't forget it. Very important. Stay in a mindset of integrity, even when it's inconvenient. Can we say that together? Stay in a mindset of integrity, even when it's inconvenient. See, that's what Joseph's doing here. He was unwilling to put her to shame, and as he thought about it more, he wasn't thinking about if he's going to put her to shame. He was now thinking about the fallout of doing the right thing. And even in that, says he was unwilling, which means there was no pulling. What that Greek word is conveying, there was no such pulling, even in his heart of hearts, to do the wrong or even selfish thing. And some can make the argument he would be doing right by himself, and he still wasn't willing to do that because there's greater things in the kingdom of God than me being right and you being right, and you know what it is? It's doing what is right. That is a high level, high standard of living for any area of life, especially our walk with God, because your character means a lot. You know, before you flip over your notes, it was Billy Graham, the great evangelist, who said this, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. That is why we want to pay close attention. And we want to make sure that we are listening intently. Because there's going to be things that try to come and compromise my character and your character. And it's going to happen when we're, it's inconvenient, but we want to stay in integrity. And that's what Joseph is doing here right now. See, integrity is important in this life. You want to turn away from what's evil so you could do what's good and then seek what God wants you to seek. As you flip over your notes, look what the psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 14. Another verse to commit to memory. Why don't we say it together aloud? Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now notice what happens when you turn away from evil. You do what is good. Well, what is good? Seeking peace. That I got to seek peace. Again, I don't got that... that Big ladle in my hand, stirring trouble. I'm a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. I'm seeking God's peace for my decisions that I got to make. I'm not going to make decisions like the world makes. I'm not going to make decisions out of the flesh. I'm going to say, God, what is your best? You know, maybe right now you got to make decisions. The best thing to do is collect information about your decision. Pray for God to give you discernment. Maybe even fast for a day and then make your decision. Or give it a time period like they did in the Bible. Maybe it's 10 days. Maybe it's 40 days. You don't want to do anything hastily. You want God's peace. But when we're caught up in a cycle of not reflecting this goodness, we make a lot of bad decisions, don't we? But you will notice this in your life. The world around you could be crumbling. But if you got the peace of God, you got all you need. Amen? And so that's the thing here. I want God's peace. 
I, I don't need perfect circumstances. I need the perfect peace of God. Isaiah 26.3 says, those who keep their minds on God, he gives them perfect peace. He keeps their mind in perfect peace. I submit to you that Joseph has a peace like never before. See, we want to be people of integrity. Michelangelo, who painted the Sistine Chapel, was once asked by the equivalency of a reporter in their day and age, and he was asked this a few different times, but why did you spend so many painstaking hours to meticulously paint areas of this work that nobody will ever see? Well, obviously, God would see it, he, he responded. He says, but I will see it. I will know if it's not done right. And see, we all know the saying, you can fool everybody else, but you can't fool God. And that's true. But you also can't fool yourself. If you choose to respond in ways that are not good, eventually you'll feel guilty. And guilt will be like a noose and eventually a weight on your neck and drag you down. God has not saved you to walk around guilty. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. The last thing that God wants for his children is for us to go back to being people who are governed by guilt. Instead, we want to walk in integrity. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Why don't we say this verse together? Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. Now, you want to know that phrase, walk securely. What that's conveying to you and I is that our needs are going to be met that we're going to be sustained, that God's goodness is going to go before us, that God is going to make a way because he's the way maker, that God's going to provide because he's a God who provides. But I need to be a person who's walking in integrity. God takes great joy in blessing his children. I never met a good parent who didn't want to reward their kids for doing the right thing. Parents, including myself, you, every kid, the next generation, you always want to give your kid more than you had. God, our Heavenly Father, can't wait to bless his children when they walk in integrity. God has blessings with your name on them, provided you're going to be like Joseph and stay in integrity even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's inconvenient. Before we move on to our last point and close, I heard about this man who was invited um, to go to this particular inventions, investment group to have his invention noticed and possibly funded. He was invited with nine other candidates. And the CEO of this investment firm was going to be there. And the job of the, nine, the 10 was to pitch their idea about their invention. Seven of them were men. The other three were women. Well, they all went. Now, one particular man, he really didn't do that well, at least to other people's eyes, in his presentation. He kind of started when he gave his presentation. He was nervous, his palms were sweaty. He was, so, he was so flabbergasted over speaking in front of people and this big time uh, billionaire that he had sweat coming down by his sideburns. He looked completely disheveled. He even messed up a few times on the statistics. The other nine hit it out of the park. Well, the investment firm announced that in addition to putting them up for the night, that they were gonna give them and charter a limousine to take them anywhere where they wanted to go. Well, they decided, the group, that they were going to go to this club, this lounge-type area that uh, you shouldn't go to whether you're married or you're unmarried. We'll just leave it there. A, a, very, a, a, a very lictatious place to go to, not a place you want to go. So one of the ten didn't decide to go, the guy who gave the presentation that wasn't so good. The next morning, they stayed overnight. They were all called in to hear the results of who was going um, uh, to win. Now, this was very significant because one of the requirements for being invited to this was you, you can't be somebody who has made it already. In other words, you, know, you had to have a, a low amount of money in the bank. You're kind of just starting out. The investor wanted to support somebody who was just starting out. And his investment of the dollars as well as his name behind this product would set that person up for life. And so he called each of them in. The first nine got told a big fat no as to why they didn't get it. The man who stuttered, he won the contest. He got the funding, and he got the billionaire's name behind him. Kind of like a Shark Tank type of show, but it wasn't a show. It was, it was a real situation coming into a room. And he was told by the billionaire, I'm aware of where everybody went last night. I'm aware that you didn't go. And if you could be trusted to do the right thing in the darkness of the night, 
You could be trusted with our money to do the right thing with your product, and you've won the contract. What am I saying? You do the right thing. God notices it. Everybody else might be getting on the bus to go do the wrong thing. You do the right thing because that's a statement of your faith and trust in Almighty God. Whether you're young or you're old, you're going to be pulled to do the wrong thing, even by your flesh. I give you this example of Joseph. There was nothing, absolutely nothing convenient about making this decision to do what he was going to do before the angel came, but he did it anyway. Because honoring God was more important than him being right or getting his way. It was about staying in integrity. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Now, how does this all work out? The angel's going to give more of the message here. The angel now has told Joseph, listen, Joseph, all this is true in the dream. Now, the next part says this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Muhammad. No, it doesn't say that. You shall call his name Gandhi. Doesn't say that. You know why it doesn't say that? Because they're dead. That's why. Jesus is alive. He would be born perfect. He would live perfect. He would go to the cross perfect. He would die perfect. He rose perfect. And he reigns perfect. And he's the only one to lay claim to that. The only one. He's the only begotten son of God. There's only one name by which you could be saved, and that's the name of Christ. When you get to heaven, it's not going to be, here's my religion, here's my denomination, let me tell you about this guy, let me tell you about that religion, that faith. No, there's only one name by which you could be saved, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. Christmas is all about God sending his son, Jesus Christ. And this is what it goes on to say, for he will save his people from their sins. We got some sins, people, do you know that? You're a sinner. And I'm a sinner. And apart from the forgiveness of Christ on the cross, you can't enter eternal life into heaven. You need to accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Tomorrow is not promised to you, but heaven is. Joseph is hearing all of this in his dream. And then it goes on to say, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord spoke by the prophet. Well, what prophet? Isaiah. 700 plus years later, this is what Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God had to, be, God had to become a man. He put on human flesh. Because how is he going to communicate to us? If somebody wrote in the sky, Jesus is the way, they would have said aliens did it or something like that. They're already talking about aliens, this and that. You need to understand something. God, from his throne on heaven, knew that this was the best way for the Messiah to come. And this was decided before the foundations of the earth. God wants you to know that because of Jesus Christ, you could still believe God for it. You still believe God for the healing. You still believe God for the breakthrough. You still believe God to make a way where there is no way. And how do we know that? Well, we don't know that just because of positive thing, just because that's somebody's opinion. We know that because God did this. He made this amazing birth happen in this way so that God's people for all their days could believe him for, listen, the impossible. That's how we are to believe. Now, how does Joseph get up here? Now, does anybody like sleep? Anybody? Anybody like sleep? I like sleep. Anybody an early riser? I'm an early riser. Some of you don't, you don't like getting up at all. Okay, we understand that. Look at verse 20, 24 says, I'm going to give you the Ray Bible interpretation of this. When Joseph got up from his sleep, he stretched out and went, good morning. Okay. I'm telling you, have you ever slept so good? You ever have one of those sleeps when you wake up and you just do one of these? You're ready to take on the world. You feel so rested, so relaxed. You might be saying, how'd that happen if he went to bed at 3 or 4 in the morning? You know why? When God gives you rest, it's better than any rest you could ever have. See, the promise and the revelation will always give you rest. That's why. That's why you got to keep your nose in the book. That's why you got to keep your feet in the church. That's why you got to be at the small group, at the prayer meeting, because God's promises will always give you rest that not even the best mattress could give you, by the way. And so God's grace is sufficient. Joseph woke up. He probably, yeah, again, I think, again, when you get to heaven, you could verify all these facts, okay? Joseph had the best sleep ever, and it, this is what it says, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. You know what that's called? Trust. That's obedience. He took his wife 
Verse 25, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. So we keep being told that because that's important. You know, all of this we just read in Isaiah, it doesn't say, and the prophet said, and the galaxy far, far away. No, this is a historical record, and the historical record says that she was a virgin. Later on, after Jesus was born and they were married, they would have kids, and Jesus has uh, siblings. You can read about that. Gospel of Mark makes that very clear. We read from one of Jesus' siblings, James, earlier, the half-brother of Jesus. But he didn't know her until after the birth, after they were married. And then the last part says, why don't we say it together? And he called his name Jesus. Of course he did, because Jesus saves, that's why. That's the very essence of his name, Christ saves. And God wants you to know that today, that he saves. And he wants you to stay in a position of faith. And so write this last principle down. Trust God and serve his plan. Can you say that with me? Trust God and serve his plan. You know, when you're doing that and you're acting in a way of goodness, it's going to bless you. You know, more on this in messages to come, but when, when you have goodness towards other people, even the Harvard Business Journal said that it releases certain endorphins in your brain that serves as natural painkillers. That when you're living in goodness, and what the article said was, and by the way, the author was, a, was an atheist, he said it's as if we've been hardwired for kindness and do the right thing. Hello? You have been. Because we're made in the image of Almighty God. Every good thing we have, and even our responses before we even know a Bible verse, that's the hand of Almighty God. Just the same way God woke you up today and brought you here. Every breath in your lungs, every step you take is a gift from God. And God wants you and I to come to a place where we trust him. And if we trust him, we'll have that inward goodness, by the way. That I'm going to trust God this way. You know, as we, before we read our last verse, one last story about just uh, the goodness and staying in that mindset and trusting God's plan and timing. I heard about this woman who was turned away at four jobs. She was a single mom. And the last two jobs... She went down to the final round. Sometimes jobs like that, you have a series of interviews. Maybe you've participated in those. They could be very stressful the longer you go. She went all the way down to the end. And each time, you got to give a presentation. You know, there's a work up towards it. And she, she, both times, the last ones, she got denied at the end. She was right there at the end. And now she's starting to get worried. Money's running out. Single mom again. And bills are piling up. Have you ever noticed, even though you're running out of money, the bills keep, keep coming? You ever noticed that? Wouldn't it be great if the bill said, okay, we're going to take a break for two months? They don't say that. They just keep coming. In fact, they come up with new ways to bang you out. Speed cameras and congestion pricing and bus lane things. Okay, listen, we understand, okay? We understand. So that was this mom's position. The bills keep coming, but they're running out of employment and, and, and severance and all of that. So she answers a call for another job interview. She lives in New York. This one's in Chicago. She maxes the credit card out for the plane ticket on short notice to go there. You've probably been there when you're right at your limit or over it. The, the credit card goes through. She's able to buy this coach ticket to Chicago to interview for this position. It was going to be an interview for one whole day, several rounds in one day. Prestigious company. She would be doing very well, probably doubling her last salary before she was let go. She had an impeccable resume. She had the age, the experience, the references, um, and she thought she'd be a shoo-in as she looked at the description. And so she prayed about it, and she's a woman of faith, and she knew that even though it was disappointing that God had a plan. She gets off the plane, taxi cab driver picks her up, starts talking to her, he was very friendly. He starts asking her questions why she's in town. She gives him the whole spiel, but she doesn't complain. She doesn't put the other employees down, even the one that let her go prematurely, even though she had seniority. She just had a positive attitude. She started talking about, hey, I, this is God's plan. She went into all of that. A woman of faith, staying in faith. He drops her off. She goes through the interviews. She did fairly well, but there were some other high-capacity people there. But she really did well. Felt that she had a good shot to land this one, but she also did before. So she gets in the car to go home. Well, the person who was conducting the interviews wasn't from Chicago either. She was from, uh, from the great state of Texas. And so the uh, cab goes to pick her up and takes her to the airport. Cab driver, friendly guy, happened to be the same guy that picked the woman up who was interviewing for the position. And he starts talking with her, and, well, what are you in town for? She goes, well, I don't live here, I live in Texas, I'm getting ready to fly back, I had to conduct some interviews for my company, goes through the whole thing. And he says, well, what's the name of the thing? And he goes through it, and she goes, wait a minute, I got the perfect person for you to hire. 
He says, I picked her up yesterday. She did nothing but talk good about her former employees, even though they did her wrong. She has a great resume. She even talked good about the companies that should have hired her but didn't. And she talked glowingly about your company and why she wanted to work here. I think she would be a perfect fit for your company. The woman thought, this isn't a coincidence. This is a God incident. <laughs> okay. And she made a decision right there in the cab before she even got to the airport to go get to the guy that would send her bags to New Orleans. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, before she even, oh, you remember that, good. Uh, she, she said right there and then, before she even got to the airport, she made her decision, I'm hiring that woman. See, you trust God's plan. There's going to be no's. There needs to be no's so God's yes could come. There's going to be disappointments. There's going to be some louses, some people who, who disappoint you. Not to worry, God's in control. Even what other people may have wanted to do to harm you, God will use it for good because you're God's child. You're in the palm of God's hand, and God has the final say. See, Joseph understood that. He responded with obedience. And I'm asking you to respond to obedience every time you can and leave the results to God. Never stop doing good. Even if you're tired today of doing what's good, you keep on keeping on because God has a way of redeeming the time and making the way straight. As we close, let's read Paul's letter to the church of Galatia together. Chapter 6, verse 9. Don't forget this verse when you get discouraged. You probably get discouraged before the day's over, okay? Don't forget this verse. Let's say it together aloud. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Do you believe that today? In God's time. Just do it God's way. Live a life of goodness. Now, don't be good just for goodness sake, like the song says, okay? You be good for God's sake. You be good because Christ went to the cross for you and for me. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't get tired of doing what was good as he was going up to Calvary, to Golgotha. I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ is the perfect example of goodness. And therefore, I encourage all of us today to be people of goodness because we overcome obstacles with good. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to partake of communion in just a moment. And I want to give you a few minutes right now in the privacy of your own heart just to pray and ask God for forgiveness of anything you've got to give over to him. There are two requirements for communion. None of them have to do with money or religion. It's that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And as a, as a believer, you ask God to search your heart. And if there's anything you've got to give over to him, you give it over to him. So take a few moments now just to confess your heart to him. And then we'll partake of communion together. Our Father and our God, we realize that these elements have no power to save us, but they are a reminder of the one who has. Lord, particularly this Christmas season, we want to remember your goodness that you've been, you've shown to us, O oh God, and your mercifulness. Lord, as we partake of communion together today, let us not forget so great a salvation. Thank you for our salvation, for the forgiveness of sins, and for this sacred reminder of our Christian faith. We commit these prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.